I'm happy to welcome you tonight and to uh, um, for, you, for you to come to hear this fabulous reading of Lainey Brown and Sheila Murphy. Um, we're very happy to have them here with us tonight. Um, some of the organizations that help make this possible is the Arizona Cares, Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, Inc., the U of A Poetry Center, Chax Press, the U of A English Department, the Arizona Quarterly, um, and you, friends and donors. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to David Weiss, who is tonight, as always, our tech wizard. Um, our, our patrons include Charles Alexander, Mary Ellen Bartholomew, Cynthia Hogue, um, Jason Lagapa, Joan Larkin, Judith Lefebvre, Cameron Louie, Lisa Martin, myself, Tenny Nathanson, Steve Salmoni, Richard Tapner, David Weiss, and Tom and Trudy Weiss. And sponsors. Sponsors are Karen Brennan, Cutthroat, mm -hmm. a journal edited by Pam Ushuk, Reed Dixon, Lynn Finger, Shell McDonald, Barbara Miller, Jameson Noenix, Jenna Osman, Anthony Sovak, and Susan Thackeray. Uh, a sponsor, I think, means they someone has contributed $50 or more. And if you have extra money lying around and like what we do, uh, you can visit our website at pogartstucson.org and find the, the support and, and donor place, and that would be wonderful. We have more upcoming readings. On February 20th, Brandon Shimoda and Tacey Atsidi will be reading. And then on March 20th, Jean Hooving and Jamie McCarty will be reading. So get out your calendars. Sasha's order, listening. I didn't make the order, but I can give it's you. on your card. Well, I, can, I can give you my ID and my card. I don't... Okay. Okay. And Tenny <laughs> can give you his ID and his card. Okay. Um, later in April, James Sherry will be reading with our musical accompanist, Najima, who's an incredible jazz singer here in town, playing with uh, Eric Matchett. So please stay tuned. Um, our first reader tonight is Lainey Brown, and she'll be introduced by Tenny Nathanson. Take it away, Tenny. Thank you. Uh, it's great to introduce Lainey. I want to I want to go back just first. And um, I think I was supposed to send a, an updated list of our patrons and sponsors. So this is gonna the only one I caught that we missed was uh, Anna Lambert, who's a sponsor. And if we missed the rest of you, it's my fault. And we'll announce your names next time. So. so it's a special pleasure to welcome Lainey Brown back to Tucson, or a virtual pleasure, or a real pleasure to welcome her virtually, or a real pleasure to really welcome her virtually <laughs> back to Tucson, or back to virtual Tucson, or, well, you get the idea. Pog is delighted to have Lainey read for us, among other reasons, because when she lived here in Tucson for several years, several years ago now, She's a mainstay of POG and of our board of directors. So welcome back, Lainey. Here are some other reasons we're delighted to have Lainey Reed. For starters, she's a terrific poet. The record speaks for itself, though I won't let it do so entirely, but Lainey is the author of something like 13 books of poetry. I think that's actually something of an undercount, including recently Lost Parkar Psalms, Scorpion Odes from Tucson's own Corey Press, Practice, and her newest, Envelop Me, published by Omni Dawn in 2017. Lainey is also a novelist or a poet's novelist, and as an editor was instrumental in bringing out I'll Drown My Book, Conceptual Writing by Women, a collection that emerged partly as an urgently needed response to the lively, contentious, and internationally bandied about conference on conceptual poetry organized by Marjorie Perloff for the UA Poetry Center about 10 years ago now. Laney has garnered several awards for his work, including a Pew for her work, including a Pew Fellowship in the Arts and a National Poetry Series Award. She earned her MFA from Brown University and now teaches at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Of Laney's book, Daily Sonnets, the redoubtable Ron Silliman writes, it's a stunner and a delight a pure dose of heady oxygen and an icon for the generations of poets who are about to show up. Speaking of sonnets, Lainey herself notes her recurrent fascination for working in and exploring poetic forms and genres, the sonnet and the elegy among them. I consider form as a container, she writes, lens, garment, 
dwelling, and means of locomotion. I find the multiplicity and heterogeneity of this list, it's a lens, or maybe it's a garment, or maybe it's a dwelling. What, was she confused? Characteristic of Laney's work and indicative of the temperament or practice that animates it. To engage a form with openness and eagerness, to discover little by little what it feels like to inhabit it, or let it touch one like the clothes one puts next to one's skin, or to learn what altered cast it gives to no longer familiar things. That's a poetics of negative capability of not knowing is most intimate. Lenny also writes, attempts to illuminate once hidden meaning are once hidden meanings are points of perforation, punctures in the fabric of writing. This doesn't feel quite like the poet makes the puncture here willfully. Maybe the form makes a way or the form gives way, gets porous, and then something slips in, as if the attempt to illuminate is the same thing as being in or with the form, which is not you and not not you. Learning to inhabit this different space and time, to be with this unfamiliar and maybe dire experience as the form helps you feel your way into it. The long illness and death of someone you dearly love, for example, Another way to say this might be to call Laney a religious poet, which might feel true or not, depending on what you mean by religion. What is this, an old teacher asked, not looking for an answer, just inviting intimacy. What is this? Laney's poems feel to me like they open toward awe or wonder, an offering, a requiem, a prayer, moving toward blessing. Please welcome Laney Brown. Thank you so much, Tenny. <clears throat> and it's so wonderful to see everyone and to be all together and to um, honor to read for Pog and to read with Sheila. So thank you all. I'm gonna be reading all new work tonight that's been written in lockdown. And um, I'm going to start with a new poem and then I'm gonna read mostly from a novella in progress that incorporates a bunch of collage work. So here we go. Um, this poem, can everyone hear me okay? All right. This poem is called Numinous. Loss of dimensionality is a threshold, inadvertent and contractive Looking out through thin glass panes, for Scythia bursts above hyacinths, a green field with twelve robins, beaks dive and pull without pause. Wind begins and then postpones itself, existing in a location I cannot hear. Prolific activity of spring does not match invisible devastation. In every home, persons hold their breaths while others pass in the street. Even from a distance, doors and windows remain protectively closed. Often the thing we fear losing is not the center of loss, but merely a cloud surrounding a subject we fail to approach. Why so difficult to pronounce what we do not wish larger than sunlight unspoken? Focus becomes action, as if one could herd unseen pathogens, tie them in place, burn in a public square. Nothing visual happens except for the empty space between bodies, on streets, near trees. A dream may be the opposite of quixotic, may gasp for air, until you wake inside a backdrop of uncertainty, impossible to shake, a shroud of night air around head and chest, an ancient cape of darkness and clamor. Who is the one waking and how to delineate, dream when no separations are actual? Divisions between bodies are illusory. I remember a time when I thought I had nothing to lose. 
freedom of nothingness pressed close against thinking. Since girlhood, what does it mean when I say I was made safe by my father, his action or my receiving now when he does not remember or an unforetold concept of later I am unable to accept my memory remains intact, and in that sense, I am accompanied. Yet, I have already lost him. I will lose him again, and that loss will be unspeakable. What I fear is not the center of loss, but a cloud surrounding an ephemeral body. In my failure to perceive, I refuse the temporal nature of being, in form and again, I don't come closer to the subject which wakes from chrysalis of dream. So that's numinous. Um, I'm gonna read mostly from this novella. It's called Lolly Basswood. And in part, um, the title is inspired by Sylvia Townsend Warner's novel, Lolly Willows, and um, it incorporates a number of invented words and also some collage. And because I'm still working on the, on the uh, text image relation and the images come maybe every 10 pages or so, um, I thought I would just give you a preview of the art and then read just from the beginning for a bit. So I'm going to do a screen share and show you some collage and then read from the beginning. So here we go. All right, does everybody see some words on the screen? Okay, I just wanted to show you these words because when you hear them, you don't know what they look like. So this is Litraye, Aeljup, and Malpe. My name is Lolly Basswood. In the most assiduous century of the Trier, fissures that open in air, I'll try to be lenient but not lost. We missed the perfume of dressing. Some parts are with us from birth until death, but far more is changeable. Unplanned precipitation of fingers. A bed cannot contain a body or dream. I learned to keep space between the bones in my body. I attempted her memoirs, feline mind. The voice is never you. Reading is an alternate dimension, a series of locations in mind. My name is Lolly Basswood. 
I am the modern equivalent of the wish to emerge from a tree. I don't know my hidden syllables, the ones I take as I enter this passage. Only once did I hear my name called in a cafe by a barista summoning someone else. She was not addressing me because I had yet to ask for anything. I was standing in line in a small cove, a coffee bar inside a bookshop, waiting for a reading to begin. Hearing my name detached was a new vantage. Who is anyone when separated from distinguishing language? With unexamined logic, I assume that as a name, a word made up of characters, a fiction, I would be absolved from all proclivities and could therefore effortlessly reside like amber resin smeared onto wrists or ink stains in every shade bled into an assortment of notebooks. What happens if I stop regarding myself as fragrance or color and step out of the nonchalant shadow of convention, the one in which it appears as if someone else were preparing lines, movements, even expressions which eventually become a face? I set out now wondering why I had ever lingered in empty coffers, three-dimensional at best. In the most assiduous century of Blitraille, when I had forgotten my inviolable center, the one belonging only to myself, I went out walking, taking all of my bodies with me, or I should say they obediently followed whether or not I bothered to invite or acknowledge them. I had no idea that Latraille was not personal, had nothing to do with me, but only with the false notion of self. I held many beliefs and these also seamlessly followed like a series of tiny flowers, buttons, scraps of paper on which words had been written, held still for brief moments before fluttering behind me as they fell. I walked out of my dwelling under several fir trees, past a grass labyrinth and a red barn until I found myself in an empty room with wooden benches and floors. I had come here, I had become here, seeking quiet. Here, silence arrived at regular intervals. Since moving to Sylvan lands, I had frequented this meeting house once a week as it was only a short walk from my home, and I found the silence in one tradition just as useful as the quiet in another. I wanted to know quiet from many lanes and angles, edges lined up, disappeared. No one spoke to me. I walked in a wide wake of green with a hood pulled up over my head. When Blatraye descended, I saw a way to steady myself against the grain of these sound woods. Trees gathered around the meeting house. Spring had begun its full array of finery, which appeared to me increasingly irre irrelevant to my near constant sorrow. I had previously no experience of Blatraye, having believed nothing devastating would ever befall me. I checked off those immaterial boxes of the virtuous, daughter, sister, wife, mother, as if these words in themselves could afford a form of protection. The silence began whenever one entered. The benches were arranged on three sides of the room. A leader sat at the front and said nothing but acted as guardian of the space and kept the time. On this particular day, no one else was present. Here I pause because how can I describe Malpe? I don't recall anything about that particular silence as compared to any other. It's of no use comparing silences, lining them up like yards of rope. The purpose of the silence is beyond the impulse to measure. When we opened our eyes to say good morning, as is the custom, the room was more still than usual and contained only the two of us. To my surprise, Malpe began talking to me almost immediately. Much later, she told me that she knew when we'd met on this first occasion, on these wooden benches, what did she know? 
That I cannot recall her words exactly is not surprising, considering the dizzying alacrity of her speech. She knew the plants. Last night I dreamed of lindens. Certain plants speak loudly if one listens. When Malpe wrote her name and contact on a small scrap of paper, I wasn't certain, but her mind casts a frequency about what I had previously considered my form, now wave-like. If asked to explain what I mean, I can only gesture to ordinary air, which, in essence, is never ordinary. Those first days after our initial meeting blew by an undefined incandescence. How long had it been since I'd met a person with such a calm yet illuminated manner who brightened the space about her without doing anything? She was not a poet exactly. And in my experience, it had mostly been poets who were able to change the dimensions of a room. Malpe sat on a wooden bench in silence and said very little. I had always relied heavily on language. I had some experience of silence, alone and with others, and yet years had passed since I had found a place or a person in whose presence the silence rang or reigned or reversed tendencies of mind. Reversed is not the right word. Possibly language is not the correct medium to speak about invisible pasts blue light, and the many dimensions I was soon to inhabit. A secret has propelled me to this moment, and yet my secret, like the most compelling of secrets, is no secret at all. My story is so common, it becomes invisible. The quotidian is overlaid with a multitude of narratives and inscrutable fears no wonder there is a lack of sentences which adequately describe the untold and the reality of those who step outside known lattices, which persons choose unornamented and non-apologetic departures, by what names do we call them? Do they reside in sturdy self-made assemblages, wear quilled coats on their way to the filmic woods? I awoke to a sound in my bedroom as if someone were close, yet it was only the wind blowing the shade against and away from the open window. As I later dressed and walked toward our designated meeting spot, I wondered, who was Malpe? I arrived at the meeting house and she suggested we speak in a garden, a place though I had been walking these grounds for years, I had never come upon. We turned a bend and there behind bamboo gates was a pond, several sitting areas, lush plantings and a wooden screen shelter. We sat inside this breezy structure, each with notebook. And so began a passage I had never imagined possible. As we conversed, enveloped by fronds, I wondered what else was hidden close, what else I had missed in my her ambulations. Where did we begin? Her face asks a question. What question? She asked me to dredge. Her face listens, her pen notes. The light changes as afternoon advances. To say we were cinematic would not be accurate. We are a living soundtrack, a series of projected images. And yet in this instance, what I could not see as I was dazzled by the quality of attention, was acute consciousness of the inadvertent film in which we mistakenly believe. Here I began my excavations. I have the distinct sense now as I write that if only I were to slow the casting of letters almost imperceptibly until the momentousness of each tiny stroke were an entire world, if I could stay here, patient enough to be clear, to be legible, then perhaps the wildly roving thoughts would also appear less invisible and more like seedlings. And then I might kneel to admire them, give them space and recall, I am here to plant words. 
speed is nothing more than a method of forgetting not only our aspirations, but also ourselves. In the time that followed Blatraye, when Eiljup arrived, minds fractured and splintered, devoutly swallowed forgetting, handing over volition. I am speaking of the self we rarely recognize, the one we cover and misplace, the one that cannot be blemished, the one we are not required to return. The further I traveled through Blatraye, the more I encountered the myth of loneliness. What does loneliness have to do with solitude? One day, an expert called to offer advice. What is an expert? Perhaps a better question is, in what circumstances do I require advice? While I considered these questions, the expert talked on and on. No boundaries, I thought, as I walked through the woods noting the emergence of buds and new leaves. I had called with the intention of obtaining information, facts, not opinions, about nothing even remotely personal. I tried to dismiss his remarks and refocus the conversation. However, his voice continued to wander and press against provinces to which I offered no admission. I moved through tangles of leaves, and emerged walking purposefully in a new and untested direction. Not long after this occasion, I heard a disconcerting sound in the same location. The moan was like a laugh from above and behind, like a song I can never remember, song, a song sung by a campfire about the sound of wind. The song is only one line, and I've spent entire days searching for it, a subtle round. I paused and looked in all directions, but could not locate the source. It happened again a few days later at about the same time and exactly in the same spot. Again, I looked up. Later, I thought, loon, and then searched the ornithology audio databases until I was able to replicate the trill and thrum. If I were to consult an expert, I would ask how to find a lost song, the resonance of which has never left. Malpe would not call herself an expert, and yet I can imagine how she might send me back to music. Sometimes Lolly will not speak for herself, and others step in. One of the many well-shod voices you might say to yourself, you don't hear voices, but that's the voice, the one that tells you, I don't hear voices, that's the one. Fixate on that voice if it ever stops talking, and you might even think of it as yourself. Lolly decided to separate from hers over and over again. She would not behave or perform for the voice. Instead, she extracted the voice and gave it a body, imagined it sitting beside her, looking like herself. She had been cohabitating with this voice for her entire life, so why not get to know her? She began when she woke, then lost the voice several times before breakfast, forgetting it was not her. She vowed to begin as many times as was necessary. Her collage assemblages distance the voice further, giving it clothes, body parts, animal heads. First, she tried just getting through a morning, remembering the voice was not her. 10.41 a.m. Recount. What happens? Trick. It does not matter what the voice is saying. It isn't you. Not you when you are content. Someone else when not. The voice is never you. Never self, yet twines like silk cellophane, subtly colored gels over light. At this rate, she wondered if she would ever get past mourning. What could be more important? How much could she remember? Or should she start with only now, this exact instant, crystallizing in front of lips? She awoke on her side. The room was cool. What was the voice saying? The voice was still in bed. She lay on her side, 
her back visible to the waist, enfolded, and then it happened. The voice left. Did the voice insert itself to ask? No, she would not talk to herself at all ever again if she remained here. That was one waking thought the voice narrated as it gradually returned, gauging the time by the light coming in through the shades. 7.30, the voice guessed, 7.44. When she rose, the voice rose with her, reminding her that her glasses were downstairs and the garden should be watered in the cool of the morning. The voice remembered some disturbances in falling asleep, doors opening and closing, steps up and down stairs. The voice took a sip of tea from the large white cup by her bed, dressed, gathered her notebooks, and accompanied her down the stairs. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you, lady. That was terrific. Are you, are you muted? Oh, I unmuted myself. Okay. Do we want to break? I don't think so. Okay. I no. am uh, going to introduce Sheila Murphy, the second reader. And it's a great pleasure. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have two poets here who whose work at least many of us have known for anywhere from 25 years to nearly 40 years. <laughs> um, Sheila Murphy is um, has been publishing since 1978. To look at her, I can't believe it's really happened the day before 1979, but <laughs> <laughs> her latest book from Luna Besante Productions in 2020 is Golden Milk. Uh, she also has a, a book in 2018, Reporting Live from You Know Where, which won the Hainaku Poetry Book Prize competition. Broken Sleep Books in 2018, published As If to Tempt the Diatonic Marble from the Ivory. Luna Basante in 2018, published Underscore. So a lot of books just in the last couple of years. If you look back, there are many more books by Sheila, including Letters to Unfinished J from Green, Green Integer, which won the Gertrude Stein Award. And uh, she is known for working in many forms, both you know, incredibly specific forms and some forms which you know allow you to stretch a little bit more, including Ghazal, Haibun, Pantum. Uh, she has also collaborated with many, uh, Douglas Barber, prominently on an extended poem called Continuations. She is also a visual artist, uh, in, also individual and collaboratively, has shown in galleries private collections, and she's a musician beyond just the music that is clear in the poetry. She's lived in Phoenix, Arizona for her adult life. Um, I had the pleasure of writing a blurb for her last book, as did Eileen Tabios, who is here today, too. And after we did that, uh, one of the publishers, uh, Catherine Bennett, did a mashup of those blurbs. And so for the rest of my introduction, I'm going to read that mashup of blurbs as in, in place of an introduction to Sheila Murphy. So she, Sheila Murphy, has acquired a basic purpose to become an adjective of words by inbeat brilliant lyricism and through a prolonged psychic breath where previously defined words illuminate and e-engage a myriad of strings. A lack of punctuation, especially her sensuous clasps, risks transparency and defined touch with hands, tunes and quiet thoughts wings out entirely somewhere else. And here she goes, tuning the tune with fluidity. Arched phrases are stated with appropriate perfection whenever there is at least one syllable to whisper formal definitions that point to an expanding vocabulary of time, letting her chords breathe yet again. Measured with all the uncertainties, steeped as they are by chastened ex-poets in this light where livestock live to maturity, she would have us consume gentlemanly acts of God 
eat poets and move us deep into fluent possibilities. <laughs> We learn her lines, diction, syntax, and the air through which she shepherds riverways with shadow artistry into her desert realm, to a place you'd think the opposite of continued, but instead it opens the light to well-plucked memories, different from reasoning, from discernibly sweet and haunting weather flowing through all the windows and doors of our world. Its colors bled from within the confines of a monsoon of something new, something ineffable, but truly within, as it opens up to all discerning worldly rats and flies, the ones hunkering down in empty lanes of leaves, undoing the words, dis or realigning each phrase like carved cheese melting in their mouths, or like trees pruned fluently in their own language so as to re-explore what is over their sofas, under their skin, and inside their heads. <laughs> so, so thank you, uh, Eileen and Catherine, for that. And without further ado, Sheila Murphy. Thank you very much for the gorgeous introduction, Charles. Thank you to the Bennetts, Dr. John and Kathy, for producing and doing this so beautifully and collaboratively to produce Golden Milk. Um, I'm honored by that book, by, by your hard work on it and your elegance in, in attention to detail uh, throughout that beautiful process. Last summer, June 30th was the official date. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you. I'm grateful to Charles and Cynthia and Nan Tenny for inviting me. I'm delighted to have the chance to read with Lainey, of course. And I thank Charles and Eileen for the beautiful blurb and Kathy Bennett for her always brilliant mashup. And that's wonderful. So thank you so much. Now, Golden Milk, what in the world's that about? You all know, many of you know, that Golden Milk is a fetching little beverage that is principally turmeric. It's an Indian beverage. It is here to help us be healthy and yellow and very pleased with ourselves. And so we can appreciate the, the health giving benefits of that. And over the last few years, we have not all been in the state of bliss. And so uh, we have had opportunities to dig deeper and try to do our best. So you'll see that the poems in this book, which is the main focus, there'll be one or two exceptions, um, reflect that perhaps, uh, what we are doing to live and have faith in continued living. So I'm, I, by the way, got the advice on sipping golden milk from a friend, Ann Bourne, who's here, a writer from uh, Brooklyn and now back to Michigan where we first knew each other. And Anne knows Dr. Susan Durda who advised me to drink golden milk. So it's all Susan's fault and I would advise anyone to take her advice always. So I'm going to begin with ovation for the overtones. Stand down Baltic Bill. Allow my evanescence to retrieve what you were looking for beneath the down quilt. Humor me, my boy. It's teacup midnight and the lashing rain slaps windows under my hand made duress. To truthify this instant, buy a comma or wainscoting to form pause points just around the corner from garage after garage. I think I'm finished siphoning the relics from the dross, so come by when you're finished playing charades with elders on the porch. It's mealtime in the Arctic now, so blunder on with how you think you think and teach me to pretend to hear. Your honor is a field day for the ladies chirping rodeo abandoned grace notes, whinnying between goalposts measured by the shared recall. Sanctify. This prayer is not your prayer. It is an adjective, a breath, a substance already abused, an integer to carve up and distribute to the one percent. It is an interval, a post-op, post-doc postulant for keeps. It is the magnifying grasp of fate. 
This prayer is obvious to a statistician. It is at the breaking point about to earn its 100,000th citation. It is gorgeous at the core when no one's listening. This prayer aspires to be a shepherd in the middle of the city when it's dark. It is a portion of the Maverick's estate. It is a symphony of chalk marks left on, in the odometer's will. It is a clock face bruised by truth. This prayer comes in a four pack as consumable as treacle. It is thick in shared experience and popped. It is a kind of crucifix in process. It is furred and wet and thought free. It is damaged by the weather still rehearsing. It is depth still unperceived. Now that, now that I have something, I have something to protect. This unwoven world may own moments in common or may not. How do we connect when we do not resemble? How might we derive a lesson from a lesson not yet learned? The earning of a heart refashions something of a brain an engine particled into invisible detente allowed in keeping. At the moment, as the moment freshens to another moment, how will we remember what we thought? And will it matter anymore? Will the, this point of thinking translate to another place from which to start? We agree more than we disagree. To pivot is an art formatted by the body chemistry poised to make shifts happen. Are you listening or merely gravitating back to zero read of the odometer? Mood swings demean soft spelling bees where photo likeness breeds consent. A mere pro forma, this debate team oxymoron versus meeting up after to decide who got it wrong. Some of you Arizonans may have been to Heber Overgard. Overgard is a remarkable place I visited in 2018 and there's a lot to be experienced there, notably the planetary viewing. Overguard was lovely lace beneath the sky's young face, repeating its eternity to wash space between violets and minerals untraced. The broken stalled stovetops confirmed smoothness woods and glowing lines of kindling to the tune of semiotic staves a mile from obligation trading wind for purity of diamonds near the cloister of the eleanor the bread and blunder speech of thought and motion holding ground until the homonyms went quiet echoing their last we sometimes think in poems and we sometimes think in questions and here is both. This piece is called 14 Questions. One, what do you mean kick the tires? Two, what if nothing we do in real life seems like poetry? Three, how many reads does it take to learn to put away a woodwind? Four, if I offer you a deal, will you smother my sales speech? Five, is there anyone who truly feels at home? Six, why a priest? Is someone sick? Seven, will I become my mother? Eight, whose integers are these and why are they infecting all my laundry? Nine, what is the difference between a homonym and compassion? 10. Overall, would you say you gain from having lost your sense of direction? 11. What is the capital of lowercase? 
12. How many softballs does it take to make a home run? 13. Are you the one who came to the door last week selling onions? 14. Will you trade your confidence for this lightly used steel gate? The chivalrous relay of puce. Against a patchwork quill penumbra, leave the world to Jennifer my coin friend in the summer of detritus when your indigo is small, as spawned as generosity itself alongside window dressing sturdily confessed astride the moonscape in its glinty afterthought, full on as warded off the cuff in the domain of angst you brothered prior to the scene salacious purposeful detente made willful as a chemist on the fly, still needling the spittoon's museum, quality magnificat, whole hog as pebbles waste the spun sun, spattering neglected raindrops. You are the better fraction of affection. Please do not forget, you are the better fraction of affection, even when it's raining. Please do not allow yourself to think that gray is real. Gray is a symptom of amnesia for the sun. Please remember that I love the halo that is always shining as your life that hovers just above this life that brings my life to light that is your light. Remember how you light the very breath of living. Please remember that gray is a mere fiction. Rain forgets to shine and simply splays across the streets and makes it hard to drive. Remember, you are vivid in imagination that is mine. You are the better fraction of affection that resides in me. Remember that a moment is as good as the eternity we've prom we're promised every day by someone we cannot hear well enough. You are the sunlight and the homonym of joy that lives across my life. And I beseech you, hear yourself continually blossoming along my heart. Do not forget you are the better fraction of affection. This is high quality paper the Bennett's produced. So it's hard to turn the pages. Good for you. Now. I watch her lose the word for vinegar. The clothes are clean, a glow about the yard, soft morning after yet another morning. All the world is speech without vocabulary. I hear her reach to touch the thing she seeks. I say a name, the walls, pure white or close. And that rectangular window very like the painting with the sound of hurt from reach as sleep that does not come. How can I paint the closeness now? How do the sounds ascend to where, they, where we were and who we are again? Very short pieces are sometimes peaceful little presents as we work. And I'm going to read you two little tiny pieces, three lines each, no text, no call, 18,844 steps. You're beautiful, no matter how you look. This one, my brother Neil is in attendance. He's written as Cornelius Sean Murphy because he's a formal person like me and Neil will recognize some things in this piece, I think. When I quiet, I am not who I become. The leaves of these vast summers do not mulch, for oak is poison to the ground. My mother calculates the number of labor hours it takes to rake them to the street. I come home from school, and I keep going back, and I keep coming home. The wind has smoke. I think a cup of tea. 
Of all the paint strokes Mr. Richardson put down across the white face of the house before the leaves began to fall. I heard him speak. I stood there asking things as he responded from the ladder top. Now, all day I listen and I orchestrate the conversation, stir the different syllables. Can you be quiet as the house attracts its color? I look around the inside walls of quite another home in which adulthood was supposed to happen. How is this familiar when I'm busy being young? When I imagine I am learning. The sky is full of flutes at rest. I know them better than I know the leaves before they fall. I think the glassed in home I had at first allowed my eyes to close. Nurse Molnar at St. Joseph's Hospital in Mishawaka, Indiana. I could open them to those who wanted me to last. Interval. How many decibels does it take to finish hosting drama now? Is there is now a mere pastime? in dust or acrimonious new takes on what was then? When I was young just yesterday, I carved today. I craved what I might be again or any time at all. The cinders made their tones and I considered that percussion. Waves and drainage and commodities as if constrained, contained, excuse me. The minister of minuscule endorsements feigning typecast acumen. Good sport, waffling, definitive decisions lingering in middle distance. In situ, fluency condones the expert witness of the heart wedged between bruises formed of fact, meshing the passions with the ivy. Solo bowls replete with green opinions yield to young sun lighting the fairgrounds whose innocence, still undiscussed, is closing in on circumstantial penitence. The blonde leafing through blinds with magnified indentured ways and means, advancing through the embers of the damned. I am sorry I do not write back. He told me as we stood masked along the North Street side, he is depressed more than before. I tell him the same without the words I listen to his eyes. I watch him shift the mask, it's difficult to breathe. Yes, it is quiet near the sanity that we presume to hold and then retrieve and lose again. How are we neighbors anymore? How were we then? What is the meaning of deciduous, my lonely, perfect friend? Why are we defined by what we barely can describe? The weather taints the skin. The street is full of gray. He told me he has lost so many decibels and pounds. I am in touch with hunger. I dispose of all the symptoms. We have many things to talk about. We are confounded by purported leadership synonymous with lust. The world is just a little round. The world is not communicable. We thought we had it nailed and now the fingerings have been forgotten and the tones are long and broken and then breathe so many times like bodies we believed we owned or were that only hold a little while. simulacrum, and it starts with a quotation from William Carlos Williams. It was evening all afternoon. Now before I bathe, I dry. Temptation lunatics its way south where I writhe to seam the limbs near peace. I pray to weather just as we do now. Remake my vortices until I cry the depths within you. Notice there are syllables to ring from threadbare sentiment I graze to breathe from scratch. 
Why don't you memorize my laundry and come clean? The drapes are taut with fiberglass and I each fleck of cloth can break the way skin emulates results of an election where nobody tithed. Innocence. I take back the statement that provoked you, pulling out your hair within the margins of my lifeline. My empathy is killing someone else. If you don't recognize the pattern, raise your index finger to confirm I hear you to my face. I feel unsure what moves I ought to make to take a stand. If there is silver near this plate, then take it back to where you came from. Coping is for wizards, not for saints. Miracles reveal how routine lives convey an instance of sobriety. As you cap capsulize this message, why am I not looking in your mirror? This is called 14 lines. I cry fluently in your language. I cloister modesty as if it were reciprocal. I leave work in my psyche constantly undone. I limit fingerings to the literature of the flute. I pay per frugal integer renouncing waste. I limit my enjoyment to deciduous remainders. I pay taxes to the tomb, tune of homely homonyms. I retrace your steps and dance in them. I translate slippers into languages of the classics. I tempt Greek and Latin in my sleep. I herald quietude in visual dimensions. I search and replace continents with states of mind. I applaud contingent acts of God for being archetypes. I'm going to read just part of a piece called Plain Text, which is a sequence of one line haiku. She's soft in her soft clothes and it is Thursday constantly. The mountain dulcimer Louise is fluent on the lovely fingers of Louise in speech. Once the smoke stopped curling, she could breathe the color of her hair. Recursive wool, uncensored weeds, the river's, river's liberation. Her silence, only slightly noisier than dust. Butterfly brevity, the makeshift in time, in tune, I'm gonna restart that again. Butterfly brevity, the makeshift in town lullaby of June. Agnes, draw your hands before approaching fresh new clay. Seeds do not announce themselves, the needed land and rain appear. Nature, once so private, I believed the leaf required my voice. Skip stones intone the thought of placid water to be crossed. Bernadine, word of my heart, the bluest of blue eyes, magnetic peace. I am going to close with my annual gift to friends, which is the winter pantoum for 2021. Just as many of you here know, I've been doing this for since the early 80s, and uh, it's my annual thing. And I love writing for occasions and have done so on at different points. This is my favorite occasion because we all share a new year. So it's, I hope, inclusive. You know most of you what a pantomime is. It is that wonderful fourfold uh, that is four lines, stands a piece where two and four become one and two, three in the next stanza, so it rolls along. And then I won't say more, we'll hear the rest. Winter Pantoum for 2021. 
Winter is a moon, a breezeless shine intoned along fixed darkness. Any day now, sweet, tall night, a blankness made of nothing else. I dream light into empty space. Along fixed darkness, any day now, sweet, tall integers take form, are clocked toward midnight. I dream light into empty space, a virginal repose warm as a loved cat. Integers take form, are clocked toward midnight, distant accordion, handful of semitones, a virginal repose warm as a loved cat, pronouncing flux as light turns crisp, cool breath. Distant accordion, handful of semitones, half steps fill the dizzy night, pronouncing flux as light turns crisp, cool breath. No matter what occurs, no matter what occurs, I feel the safety of your back. Half steps fill the dizzy night. Imagine reverence, unforced as blushing sight. No matter what occurs, I feel the safety of your back. Intention matters, lasts beyond mere fact. Imagine reverence, unforced as blushing sight. The limber creatures correspond to its sketches slight. Intention matters, lasts beyond mere fact. As insolence is washed, we learn new flight. The limber creatures correspond to sketches slight. Cool colors obviate geometry at night. As insolence is washed, we earn new flight. Locations broken unify insight. Cool colors obviate geometry at night. A blankness made of nothing else. Locations broken unify insight. Winter is a moon, a breezeless shine in tone. Thank you.